Okay, so our next panel is going to be on animal welfare. We have three great uh, speakers here with us today. The first is Erica Meyer, uh, from the Director of Compassion Over Killing, Paul Shapiro from HSUS, and Alexis Fox from HSUS as well. So I'm going to just introduce Alexis, and then she's going to introduce Paul and Erica. Uh, Alexis Fox is the Massachusetts State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. She helps animals through legislation, corporate campaigns, citizen advocacy, and coalition building. With more than a decade of experience in advocacy, Fox has worked with numerous animal protection organ organizations, including the ALDF and the National Center for Animal Law. With that said, please. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you so much to the Harvard Saldiff and the Food Law Society for putting on this amazing event. I know how hard it is to put an event like this together, and yet it is so important that we bring people together from a diverse array of backgrounds and perspectives to talk about how we are going to fix our broken food system. So like many of you, I learned about factory farming when I was in college. I was an environmental studies major, and I was very interested in local agriculture. So I was learning about CAFOs, combined animal feeding operations, and their impact on local air quality and water quality. The people who were living around these facilities were getting sick. And one day, when I was talking about waste runoff with someone, it really dawned on me that that waste was being created by real animals. Animals that had the same capacity to feel joy and pleasure, but also discomfort and pain and fear as my family's dog. And yet while my family's dog got to wake up every single day and go to sleep every single night in our house, usually on my bed, these animals were waking up every single day and going to sleep every single night in those putrid facilities that were making people sick. And that's when my interest in factory farming transformed into a real passion. So I moved to DC, and that's where I met Paul Shapiro and Erica Meyer. And one of my favorite quotes about advocates and protesters is this. I'm going to paraphrase. But it goes something like this. Advocates are like the proverbial canary in the coal mine. But instead of quietly dying, they sing out. Paul and Erica have been singing about these issues for over a decade, and I've been honored to work with them as we see the issues that we sing about go from the fringes into the mainstream. They are some of the most brilliant thought leaders of our time. So it is my honor to introduce Erica. Erica is the executive director of Compassion Over Killing. Compassion Over Killing works with law enforcement to investigate and prosecute animal cruelty on factory farms. They also run the DC Veg Fest, which attracted over 10,000 people this year. And they work with companies to provide healthier, more sustainable food choices for us, the consumers. So thank you so much, Erica. Well, thank you, Alexis. Alexis has been a hero of mine, so I'm honored to be on this panel with you. Um, so first, I want to start out by uh, a full disclosure that most of you in the room uh, may be attorneys or law students. And unlike most of you in the room, I'm not a law student, nor am I attorney. So knowing that, full disclosure, I'm hoping that I will now benefit from your lowered expectations. <laughs> um, and I am going to start today by asking you what might be the most important question that you will be asked here today. How many factory farmers does it take to screw in a light bulb? Now, some of you may know this answer. Alexis is giggling. Maybe you've heard this. I'm not sure. But think about this. How many factory farmers does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the answer is none, because they want to keep consumers in the dark. 
And, and that may be a joke, but it's also relevant to the discussion today because there is truth in jest. When we're talking about ag-ag laws and the transparency and what Dave Simon had mentioned about factory farming and what goes on behind these closed doors, it happens behind closed doors for a reason. Because if people were to see this, they would be outraged, and the industry knows this. In fact, there's a quote in an, uh, in an agricultural textbook that highlights that one of the best things modern animal, animal agriculture has going for it is that most people haven't a clue how animals are raised. For modern animal agriculture, the less the consumer knows about what's happening before the meat hits the plate, the better. They know that these are horrors that, would, that the public would be outraged to see and they want to keep this imagery hidden from you. They want to keep consumers in the dark, and that's exactly what they're starting to do with what we're going to be discussing a bit today are these ag-gag laws. So what is an ag-gag law? Essentially, these are laws aimed at stopping the undercover videos from being filmed inside these facilities. They are, take shape in a, in a few different ways, but their goal is all the same. So some of them are aiming to ban the taking of a photo or a video inside these facilities without the owner's consent. Some of these laws eventually are, are, are essentially making it a crime for an investigator to work inside the facility, meaning that they're asking you if you are affiliated with the animal organization and making it an elevated penalty if you omit that affiliation. And requiring mandatory reporting with, the, with very, very short timelines that you don't have an opportunity to document a pattern of abuse that's often needed in order to prosecute in a cruelty case. And you're also outing yourself as the animal investigator within a very short time frame. All of these are, are forms of ag gag laws, and they all have one goal in mind. That goal is to make it a crime to go undercover inside factory farms and get video footage of what is really happening to these animals. They're trying to criminalize the animal investigators. This is what they'd rather you think, that old McDonald's farm, these are happy animals living in an outdoor barnyard setting. We sing story childhood um, you know, songs about this and books about this. You'll see packages that look similar to this in grocery stores on different meat, egg, and dairy products. But this is so far removed from reality. This is the myth that the animal industry would prefer that you continue to think about. But in reality, Animals today overwhelmingly are living inside these massive factory-like farms. These are mechanized systems where the animals are often enclosed in these, in these tight windowless sheds from egg-laying hens crammed inside battery cages to female pigs stuck in gestation crates that are barely wider than their bodies. They can't even lay down. Uh, comfortably, they are unable to, completely unable to turn around, to chickens raised for their meat, raised by the tens of thousands inside of one single shed. And these birds are genetically manipulated so that they grow so fast and they're so obese that they often collapse under their own body weight because of leg deformities and they can no longer even walk around to access food and water. This is exactly what the meat industry doesn't want you to see. And this is exactly what's being uncovered time and time again, an undercover investigation after undercover investigation that is showing severe animal cruelty. It's uncovering food safety issues leading to meat recalls. It's leading to slaughterhouse shutdowns and it's leading to prosecutions of animal cruelty. They don't want us to see any of this, and this is exactly why we're showing some of this to you today, so you understand why the industry is fighting so hard. It's, it's using its lobbying muscle to pass these ag gag laws across the country. A couple quick examples of some undercover investigations and what they have shown and resulted in. This is an undercover investigation in 2008 inside a dairy cow slaughter plant in California. The result after this investigation of extreme abuse, USDA shut the facility down. It led to the largest meat recall in the nation's history, 143 million pounds of meat. The company filed for bankruptcy. It also led to the prosecution of two of the employees who were caught on video abusing these animals. Another investigation in North Carolina, 2011, a butterball turkey factory farm. After this video was released, 
five workers pled guilty to animal cruelty, and one North Carolina State Department of Agriculture official was convicted of obstruction of justice trying to interfere in the case. Another example, in 2012, Central Valley Meat, another dairy cow slaughter plant in California. After this video was released publicly, the USDA immediately shut the facility down for a week, citing egregious, inhumane handling and treatment of animals. It was heavily lobbied to open the facility back up. But as a result of this video footage and the media coverage, several major suppliers, including Costco, McDonald's, and In-N-Out Burger, severed ties with this facility. And yet another example of a pig breeding factory farm in Wyoming, after this video footage was released, uh, five employees pled guilty to cruelty to animals. In 2013, just this fall, Compassion Over Killing released yet another undercover investigation, this time inside a Colorado calf raising facility called Quana Cattle Company. And the abuses were so extreme that as a result, three of the employees caught on video were charged and two of them have pled guilty to criminal animal cruelty. One case is still pending. And these are the abuses that are routinely exposed in undercover investigations. And rather than trying to put a stop to these abuses, the animal agribusiness is trying to stop the American public from even finding out about it in the first place. And I have a short video that I want to show you that highlights how this case is unique in the sense that not only are they desperately trying to keep people, the, the public, the American consumers from seeing this video footage in Colorado, after our investigator turned over the footage to local authorities, they charged her with a crime, even though there is no ag-gag law in Colorado. I'm an undercover investigator for Compassion Over Killing. You are not supposed to know my name, or see my face, or even hear my voice. Because this isn't about me. It's about the violence that's inflicted on animals and their suffering that's kept secret, locked behind the closed doors of factory farms and slaughterhouses. My job is to remain unknown, to wear a hidden camera and document what animal agribusiness doesn't want you to see. I am a whistleblower. And I want you to know what is happening to me because I witnessed and reported animal abuse. Ew. And now the meat industry is trying to silence me. Last week, the sheriff charged three men with animal abuse for allegedly mishandling cows. A woman documented with video the abuse over several months. And today, the Weld County Sheriff's Office says her failure to act was also criminal. Deb, it really is fairly unusual for any whistleblower to be charged. The reason, it discourages other whistleblowers from coming forward, even those who are well-intentioned. If convicted, she could face up to 18 months in jail. Quanta Farms eventually fired the men, a move that still makes the video no easier to watch. The good news in this case is that there was a lot more media attention that resulted as it, which educated the public tremendously on the abuses that these animals are enduring. But also, as a result of the public pressure, as well as the fact that this was an absolutely baseless charge, they charged her with a crime, although the law did not support this at all. And eventually, the charge was, in fact, dropped. And the case is still going, the three cases are still going forward against the employees who were caught on film actually abusing the animals. And this is so important to highlight how desperate the animal agribusiness is to not only hide what's happening behind closed doors, but to stop people like Taylor from filming and getting that footage out to the public. So talk about really quickly, where are these laws happening? What is going on and how serious is this as an issue? Well, in 2012, we started to see animal agribusiness supported laws being introduced. These are anti-whistleblower or ag-gag laws. And they're all slightly different in how they're worded, but again, the goal is the same. They all want to criminalize undercover investigators like Taylor. We saw laws being introduced in Nebraska, Minnesota, New York, Indiana, Illinois, Florida. Laws actually passed in 2012, ag-gag laws passed in Utah, in Iowa, and in Missouri. 
Those laws passed in 2013, and the rest of the states, they were defeated, or in 2012, the rest of the states, they were defeated. But that did not stop animal agribusiness. They came back with a vengeance in 2013 and introduced more bills in more states. And what happened as a result of the pressure that was put on and animal activists across the country speaking out as well as other organizations opposed to these bills, every single bill that was introduced in 2013 was defeated. Not a single ag-gag bill passed in 2013. <laughs> Definitely worth applauding. In fact, it was known by NPR, it was dubbed as the year, to, the year bills to criminalize animal cruelty videos failed because not a single one of these passed. It's important to note, though, that that bright light that the animal agribusiness is trying to prevent us from shining on what is really happening behind the meat, egg, and the dairy industries, they are working so furiously, they are so feverishly trying to pass these laws, it's only proving that, in fact, animal agribusiness has something very important that it's trying to hide from the public. That's the truth. And that's the truth that we have on our side, and they know this. And in fact, there was so much attention drawn to this issue that the media was outraged by what was happening, and they themselves, in 2013 and more recently, are blowing the whistle on these anti-whistleblower bills, and they are getting this footage more and more in the media, which is exactly what the meat industry was trying to stop. We've seen coverage on ABC News talking specifically about this issue and showing the footage nationwide. We're seeing the New York Times editorializing about it, saying that one thing that these ag-gag laws guarantee is increased distrust of American farmers. We're seeing a Los Angeles Times when an ag-gag bill was introduced in California, saying that this bill should be put out of its misery and killed, and it was. We're also seeing CNN highlighting how it's trying, the animal agribusiness is trying to keep consumers in the dark, showing the exact footage the industry is trying to prevent the public from seeing. We're even seeing Rolling Stone magazine highlighting that animal activists are trying to uncover what's happening in the meat industry, and now agribusiness giants are trying to crush them. There has been so much media attention about this issue that the National Pork Producers Council needed to do its own study on it to figure out what was happening. And shockingly, what did they find? They found that 99% of the stories about ag-gag were negative. 99% of these stories were negative. They did not favor the meat industry. Americans have a right to know where their food comes from, and that's exactly what the media is uncovering. A study that was done by the Kansas State University Department of Agriculture Economics looked at media coverage and how does all of this media coverage of factory farming and animal welfare, how does that impact consumers? They found that as a whole, media attention to animal welfare has significant negative effects on U.S. meat demand. The study concluded that increasing media attention to animal welfare issues triggers consumers to purchase less meat. And not just purchasing less meat in the industry that's being exposed, but purchasing less meat across the board. And as we're seeing increased media attention on these issues, an increased focus on how these animals are being treated and what we can do to try to stop it, that's exactly what we're seeing, is people purchasing less meat. For years in the United States, we have seen meat consumption go up and up and up, year after year after year. But now, Meat consumption is actually starting to drop, starting in 2007 is when the, the studies are showing this. This is all from the USDA. In fact, meat consumption is down by 12% in the last five years. But not only is meat consumption dropping, there's a change of dialogue about meat that we're seeing. One study showed that there was so much talk about meat on the internet. They went into social chat rooms and comments on different articles and what people were writing about generally. They found that 43% of conversations about meat were negative and often included words as bad, concerns, and problem. 
Th that's what meat is now associated with, bad concerns and problems. In fact, it was so alarming to one major fast food chain that they're no longer even using the word meat. They're now just saying it's protein because they don't, they're afraid to use the word meat because it has such a negative connotation to it. So in addition to people purchasing less meat and companies moving away from using the word meat because of its negative association, we're also seeing more and more people choosing vegetarian foods. Specifically, we're seeing 15 million Americans are, are, say, are saying that they are vegetarian 100% of the time. We're seeing 50 million Americans say that they are vegetarian about 50% of the time. So half of their food choices are 100% meat-free. And we're also seeing a growing number of people, about 60 million Americans say that they participate in Meatless Mondays. So this is all incredibly good news. We're defeating many of the ag-gag bills. We defeated all of them in 2013. Meat consumption is starting to drop. We're seeing an increased interest in vegetarian and vegan foods from consumers across the board. This is the time that we need to keep pushing the ball forward. We need to strike while the iron is hot. The industry is on defense, and they know that we are right. They know that Americans deserve the right to know the truth. And while some animal activists may prefer to just sit around and watch what's going on, <laughs> that's Emma, our little cat. We need to act now. There has never been a more important time to speak out on behalf of farmed animals and to stop these cruelties from continuing inside these factories, from happening behind these closed doors. We need to continue pulling back the curtains. Ag-gag is still here. In 2014, we have seen bills being introduced in Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, Arizona, and in fact, one bill so far this year in Idaho has passed. So we cannot stop now. We have to keep fighting for these animals. Animal agribusiness isn't going to give up, and neither can we. And we have so many people on our side. It's not just animal protection organizations like Compassion Over Killing or the Humane Society. We are talking about a widespread interest in making sure that ag-gag bills are not passed and the right to expose this cruelty is not uh, suppressed because we as consumers have the right to know this information. Perhaps the strongest voice, or my favorite quote, about ag, ag comes from an industry representative herself, Temple Grandin from Colorado State University. She says that I think the ag, -ag bills are the stupidest thing that ag ever did. It's like you're covering up, cover up, cover up. You know, when you get bashed, you need to be opening the door, not shutting it. And that's exactly what we are doing, is we are opening the door, even though the industry is trying to shut it. We know that animal agribusiness wants us to not show these videos, which, it, which leaves us with the most important thing we can do today. If you take nothing else away from today's presentations, know that each one of us can share these videos, which, which is exactly what the industry does not want us to do, and that's why they're trying to pass these laws. We can also make changes to help to protect animals in our dietary choices every day. And there might not be an ag gag law in Massachusetts right now or a bill that you can help fight, but there are ways that Alexis is going to talk about how you can get active to protect animals right here in Massachusetts. But the most important takeaway from today is that each one of us can speak out for animals by doing exactly what the meat industry doesn't want us to do, distribute these undercover videos. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Erica, so much for your brave work. It is now my honor to introduce Paul Shapiro. Paul founded Compassion Over Killing in 1995, and a decade later, he moved over with a team of other advocates, including Josh Bulk, to the Humane Society of the United States. Um, I have been able to watch 
Paul throughout the years and have been absolutely amazed by what an incre incredibly savvy leader he is. Under his leadership, many things have happened, which I I'm sure he will talk about. One of the most important things that happened was in 2008, California passed Prop 2, which was the ballot initiative that banned gestation crates, veal crates, and battery cages. So thank you so much, Paul, for your amazing work, and thank you for being here. In Thanks, that. Alexis. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Do I need to use this mic or no? Yes. Can you guys all hear me? Use the mic, okay. <laughs> the power of one person, it's really amazing. Okay, uh, first and foremost, I wanna say thank you to Alexis. I come to Massachusetts bringing a gift for her cats from my cats. We have a little mouse here with a great scratch pad and a little thingy here. So here you go, thank you for the generous introduction. My cats are so happy. <laughs> um, there are a lot of VIPs in this audience. I'm psyched to be sharing it with, uh, sharing this crowd with so many of you one of whom represents one of my favorite organizations, David Komen Heidi represents the Humane League. David, raise your hand. Give him a round of applause. Listen, who here is a member of the Humane League? Raise your hand, all right? We have, oh, okay, good. We see one, you're the first person I saw here aside from Alexis, so you're gonna get a free field grist t-shirt. All right, here's your big win for the day. <laughs> free field grist t-shirt, yeah, give him a round of applause. The rest of you who are not members, shame on you. You should go online and donate to them so that you can become members. At the end, during Q&A, you better listen up now because there will be some uh, statistics or you can have some fun trivia that you'll win a free book if you remember what you hear in this talk. So don't ignore what I say. All right. Uh, my name is Paul Shapiro with the Humane Society of the United States. It's an honor to be with all of you today. It's a real honor, to, especially to be with folks like David Simon, whose book I love, with Bob Martin, a hero of mine. Bob in the back gets so much press. I don't even want to know where his security guards are, but I want to make sure I get to go shake his hand later. Some woman raised her hand there. She's Bob's security. Listen. <laughs> Erica said a couple times, the one thing you're going to take away, do as she said. I'm going to say no. If there's one thing you're going to take, no, just kidding. If there's another thing that you're going to take away, I want you to remember that our movement, the movement to protect farm animals, is winning. All right? You know that you're winning when religious figures like the Dalai Lama are talking about our issues, saying that turning these defenseless animals into egg-producing machines is a degradation of our own humanity. You know that we're winning when it's not just Eastern religious figures, but also Western religious figures, like Pope Benedict, or now Pope Emeritus Benedict, when he said, and I quote, that confining hens, uh, excuse me, hens are so packed together, they become just caricatures of birds, contradicts the relationship of mutuality that comes across in the Bible. You know you're winning when there's even somebody with more followers than the Dalai Lama and the Pope combined is talking about our issues. Now, what religious figure could I possibly be referring to as more followers than the Dalai Lama and the Pope combined? Who could possibly fill out this holy trinity? Uh, obviously, I'm talking about somebody who I call the Pope Rup, or Oprah, <laughs> who says that I learned about, God, I can't keep it looking, I'm going over here. I'm gonna shout for you, all right? I learned about how these animals are treated and mistreated before they get to our tables. It's appalling and beneath our humanity. We've neglected basic human decency on such a large scale. It really does bleed over into every aspect of our lives. Whether you read the conservative trade press like American conservative, Pat Buchanan's magazine, in which they headlined torture on the farm, why conservatives should care about animal cruelty, or whether you read the more liberal publications like the editorial pages of the New York Times where they editorialized industrial confinement of farm animals is cruel and senseless and will turn out to be a short-lived anomaly in modern farming. That's exactly what the Humane Society of the United States is trying to do, to ensure that this half-century experiment with factory farming indeed will become a short-lived anomaly in modern farming. Now, you heard a little bit about some of the laws from David, and I'm gonna just stress a couple things. When you think about farm animals, and then you think about dogs and cats in our country. In our country, we have anti-cruelty codes in all 50 states, codifying this basic notion that there are some things that we can do to other animals that are so heinous, we think they ought to be punished with criminal 
penalties. So the whole debate over whether animals deserve legal protection, that's not a debate. We've stipulated that as a society, that animals at least deserve some legal protection. In all 50 states, we have anti-cockfighting laws. In fact, it's a felony in 41 states. So when people tell you chickens don't have any legal protection, tell them, hey, I know in 50 states it's criminal to take two birds and put them in a ring and let them fight each other. It's illegal in all 50 states to engage in dog fighting as well. In fact, it's a felony in all 50 states to engage in dog fighting. So again, the question isn't whether animals deserve legal protection. It's not even whether chickens deserve legal protection. The question, though, is if we're going to raise these animals for food, then do they deserve any protections whatsoever? We know that farm animals are like the dogs and the cats who we welcome into our homes and into our families. They have likes, they have dislikes, they're individuals. And most importantly, like those dogs and cats, they want to avoid suffering. Yet we cause them to suffer in such great numbers that if you were to take every other form of animal exploitation and combine them all, whether it's animals used in experimentation, animals killed for their fur, animals used in circuses or in sea parks, animals killed by hunters, every other form of animal exploitation and combine it all and compare it to the number of animals who are slaughtering for food, it doesn't even come close. And the point of this is not to suggest that we shouldn't be concerned about dogs and cats and animals in labs and so on. Of course, we should be concerned about all animals. But the point is that if we are concerned about all animals, we need to get a lot more serious about showing our concern for farm animals because they represent nearly all of the animals who we are exploiting. You can see here in a chart, you could see here in a chart, a really cool chart that you're going to now miss. It was awesome. Trust me, you guys are really missing out. The whole talk sucks without it. The um, point is that we don't have to just think about these odd discrepancies between the legal protections for dogs or even chickens used for fighting and then farm animals. We, there's a lot of polling that shows what Americans already think about this issue. And I don't mean polling that's been done by people at the Humane Society or Compassion Over Killing or the Humane League or the Pew Charitable Trust. I'm talking about polling by the ag industry itself. The American Farm Bureau Federation did its own survey funded through Oklahoma State University. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Oklahoma State. Hardly a bastion of animal rights radicalism. And what do they find? Americans overwhelmingly think that animals deserve protection. 81% think that farm animals have roughly the same ability to feel pain and discomfort, not just as dogs or cats, but as human beings. Oh, nearly all of us, 95% say it's important that animals on farms are well cared for. It makes you wonder who these 5% of psychopaths are who's like, you know, I really don't care. Set almost, or more than two thirds of us say the government should take an active role in promoting the welfare of farm animals. Three quarters of us say we'd vote for a law in our state requiring farm animals to be treated better. Yet only 18% of us say that confining sows in gestation crates is humane. In other words, we have a major gap. We have a gap between what Americans want for farm animals, that is legal protection from abuse, and what farm animals are actually getting. And it's within that gap that we now see what David was talking about earlier. We don't have a single federal law that relates to the treatment of animals while they're on factory farms. At the state level, we have most states having anti, their anti-cruelty codes have exemptions for customary agribusiness practices, no matter how cruel the practice may be, no matter how abusive or painful it may be. So if you were to take your dog to the vet and he were to, and I say he because I presume only a male vet would do this, castrate him without any pain relief rather than neutering him with pain relief, what do you think would happen to that vet? Lose his license, get sued, maybe get thrown in prison. But what if it wasn't a vet? What if, and what if it wasn't a dog? What if he was a pig? And he was an untrained farmhand with no animal care experience whatsoever. All of a sudden, because it's a customary agricultural practice, the same exact act of cruelty, cutting an animal's genitals off without any pain relief, all of a sudden becomes legal. You add all this up, and farm animals don't have no legal protection. They do have some, but they have virtually none. Erica listed a great litany of recent cruelty cases that have been successfully prosecuted against farm animal abusers. So if somebody tells you they don't have any legal protection, you know that's not true. But they have nearly no legal protection. And if that were the case for farm animals today, if that's how they were raised, maybe we wouldn't need so many types of different legal protections for them. But it's not. Most farm animals aren't raised like that. They're instead raised on factory farms. In fact, if you look here, that little tiny sliver in that pie chart 
That's the percentage of farm animals in our country who are raised out on pasture for their lives. That tiny little sliver. In fact, I had to make that sliver a little bit bigger just so that you could see it. The rest of them are on CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations. Yet we still have in the meat industry, their spokespeople telling us things such as, the technologies used by today's farmers provide the most comfortable living conditions that food animals have ever had. When I read this, I was thinking to myself, could anybody really think that gestation crates where pigs are unable even to turn around are the most comfortable living conditions in 10,000 years of animal agriculture, that that is the most comfortable they've ever been? And then I started thinking to myself, I wonder what it would look like to be literally the most comfortable conditions they've ever had. I started looking around, this is what I found, and I think that might be like the most comfortable conditions farm animals have ever had. But I still haven't been to a farm that looks like that yet. Instead, most farms instead look like this, where millions of breeding pigs are locked inside of gestation crates immobilized for their entire lives, where hundreds of millions of egg-laying hens kept inside of battery cages so small they can't even spread their wings, or billions of chickens who are raised for meat genetically manipulated to grow so obese so fast that many of them have difficulty even taking a few steps before collapsing under the bulk of their own unnaturally heavy weight. Or we take cows who we're using for dairy and we slice their tails off without any pain relief whatsoever. These are the type of things that we as an animal protection movement need to try to alter the course of history on. When Gandhi says that a small body of determined spirits fired by an unquenchable faith in their mission, people like those of us in this room, that, I think, is how we're going to alter the course of history for farm animals, and exactly that is what's happening now for animals. Just last month, after a Humane Society of the United States investigation was released, New York Times columnist Nick Kristoff editorialized on this topic, asking, is that sausage really worth this? <laughs> Saying that they live out their adult lives without exercise or meaningful social interaction. It's like a life sentence in solitary confinement in a coffin. Keep in mind, this is one of the most respected columnists in American, in American um, journalism talking about issues that 10, 15 years ago, nobody was talking about in the mainstream press. Just a month earlier, the Humane Society of the US released an investigation at a calf slaughter plant in New Jersey that showed such egregious cruelty that USDA came in and shut the plant down for two weeks. Keep in mind, USDA hardly ever shuts a plant down for two seconds, two minutes, and here, you see a plant shut down for two weeks because of animal cruelty, sending a very loud signal to other slaughter plants that would engage in the types of abuses we uncovered there. We saw five employees plead guilty to criminal animal cruelty after an HSUS investigation at a pig factory in Wyoming. And now we see, as a result of these types of exposés, this. That's what the meat industry wants, to keep us all in the dark. And our job as animal advocates is to ensure that we shine a bright light on this otherwise dark and very hidden world of animal cruelty. Our investigations are leading to meat recalls, slaughter plant shutdowns, congressional hearings, new federal policies, and more. And yet, what's the meat industry's response? The meat industry's response is not to try to prevent the abuses we're uncovering from taking place. The meat industry's response is to try to criminalize what we are doing by saying, as the New York Times headline, videos show cruelty on the farm and taping becomes the crime. In other words, they want to blow the whistle on the whistleblower. What they want to do is make it a crime not to abuse the animal, but to take a photo of somebody abusing the animal. Think about how desperate you must be as an industry when you're so concerned about what you're doing to animals that you want to make it a crime for somebody just to document what you're doing. Fortunately, animal protection groups are on the case. They're sending out their most intelligent, most handsome, most articulate spokespeople onto the airwaves to debate these issues, to try to combat the meat industry time and time again. And as Erica indicated, we're winning. Not because of my debates, but because of many other people's fantastic work. We're winning not just in terms of stopping the ag-gag bills, we're winning on our own offensive bills. Keep in mind, when, uh, when the first laying hen investigations were done in this country in 2001, there wasn't a single state that had banned any factory farming practice at all. Today, we have passed laws in 10 states, including just recently in Kentucky, to ban either battery cages, veal crates, gestation crates, force feeding for foie gras, tail docking of dairy cows, and so on. 
Clearly, we are making real progress in helping to establish the precedent that farm animals deserve at least some types of legal protections. And it's not just legal protections. We're seeing in the corporate boardrooms across America the biggest meat sellers starting to mandate that their meat suppliers improve their own animal welfare standards with all of these companies within the last two years telling their pork suppliers that they don't want them using gestation crates anymore, putting the writing on the wall clearer than ever that this form of extreme confinement simply has no future in the pork industry, and the pork industry is hearing it. In fact, many of the biggest pork producers now have made announcements that they are getting rid of gestation crates in their own supply chains, and this is leading our opponents, for example, the Animal Agriculture Alliance, this is their illustrious leader, Kay Johnson, to say the following. This is the kind of thing that nobody believes you until it's happened. But in the last five years, it's been like a wildfire, concluding these groups are winning. For years, the animal protection movement has been right about this factory farming debate, and now we find ourselves not only on the right side, we find ourselves on the winning side time and time again. But it's not enough to win on getting pigs the ability to turn around. It's not enough to get chickens to spread their wings. These are important gains. They're historic gains, but we know that they are modest gains as well. We have to remember that nine out of 10 animals we exploit are farm animals, and nine out of 10 of those animals are on factory farms. You remember this chart here showing the percentage of animals who aren't out on pasture? Well, what if we were to try to get a 500% increase in the number of farm animals who are no longer on factory farms but instead are out on pasture? What we would see is something like that. That's what this chart would then look like. Clearly, that would be a big improvement for those animals, but it would remain that more than 90% of the animals are still gonna be locked inside of factory farms. And the point of this is to suggest that yes, we need to be fighting to improve the treatment of farm animals, but at the same time, as was indicated by both of the earlier two speakers, we also have to be fighting the fact that we Americans are the kings of the carnivores. And the economists, they talk about the world's biggest meat eaters, and look at us. The United States perched nearly atop the world, eating more meat than virtually any other nation on the face of the planet. However, keep in mind, this was a 2007 survey that was done. Fast forward to today, and more and more Americans are starting to eat a saner, more ecologically sustainable, more humane diet. People are moving from a diet that's inhumane <laughs> to a diet that is a little bit more humane. How so? Well, as you, I'm sure you've never seen this before, but if you look at animal consumption in the United States from 1984 to the present, it was going up and up and up. And I don't wanna be a spoiler for you, but spoiler alert, in 2007, meat consumption started falling off a cliff and it continues to drop so much so that if you look at the number of animals, the number of land animals we're raising for food in our country, starting around World War II to the present, it was just going up and up and up and up from around 100 million to 9.5 billion. Today, however, that number has dropped. Despite more humans in the country, meat consumption has fallen so much that we raised 9.0 billion land animals for food in 2012. Half a billion fewer animals were subjected to the miseries of factory farms and slaughter plants in 2012 than in 2007. Think about that for a second, if you were to take all animals used in experimentation, all animals killed by hunters, all animals used in every other form of, of uh, institutionalized exploitation, that's less than half a billion. This is one of the biggest gains of the animal protection movement that there has ever been. And yes, it's multifactorial. It's not entirely due to animal welfare concerns, but that certainly is playing a role. And let us not forget that when we talk about nine billion or half a billion or whatever, these are all individuals. It's easy for us to get lost in statistics, but each one of those animals is an, is an individual with the same spark of life that we have, with the same desire to avoid suffering that we have. Now, why are people starting to eat less meat? Well, maybe they're seeing the health benefits that people like Bill Clinton have gotten when he announced that he is now a vegan. Or maybe they're hearing from Al Gore talking about how he just felt better when he adopted a vegan diet a year ago and how he's gonna continue doing it. But that's not what most people are doing. Most people aren't becoming vegetarians or vegans. In fact, the population, the percentage of Americans that's vegetarian or vegan has remained relatively stable for decades. 
What's really skyrocketing, though, is the number of Americans who are not necessarily stopping eating animals, but they're cutting back on their animal consumption. They're engaging in things like Meatless Monday, which is being spearheaded by groups both like HSUS and Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. They're also getting great publications like HSUS's Guide to Meat-Free Meals, a wonderful guide that you should check out. Or what if they don't want to get a guide from an animal protection group? What if like, oh, that's weak. I don't care what an animal protection group says. Maybe they can get their guide from Oprah. If you go to her website, Oprah.com, you can just get Oprah's Vegan Starter Kit. Or you might be thinking to yourself, oh, dude, that's weak. Oprah, she's not even on TV anymore. I don't know. Who's, anyway, who is, anybody know who is the number one daytime talk show host now? Oh, Ellen, that's interesting, because on the Warner Brothers website, Ellen has her own going vegan with Ellen. The point of this is that when I became a vegan in 1993, people didn't know what the word meant. People didn't know how to pronounce it. People had no idea if you were from the Star Vega or if you were, I mean, nobody knew anything about this. And now people like Bill Clinton, Al Gore, Oprah, and Ellen are touting the benefits of plant based eating. An idea that was firmly in the, in the margins is now firmly in the mainstream. Meat reduction is here to stay, and we're going to continue seeing more and more of it. Even entire school districts like Los Angeles Unified, which is serving 650,000 students every single weekday, are implementing entirely meatless Monday programs, where every single Monday, 100% of all their meals are vegetarian on Monday for more than half a million students. Also, people's own health insurance companies wanting to have fewer health care costs are encouraging them to start eating less meat. In fact, Kaiser Permanente just put out a new um, piece of literature to its own uh, subscribers. Some of you may be included in that, in which they said, any movement toward more plants and fewer animal products can improve your health. We're seeing also the American Institute for Cancer Research saying when it comes to American health, the research shows one thing very clearly. We all need to eat more plants and less meat. Even the AARP is telling its members cutting back even a little on meat can lengthen your life. Some people are doing it for ecological reasons. The EPA says that to slaughter just one chicken, imagine you walk through the supermarket aisle, you pick up that bird, put it in your cart, you might as well go down to the beverage aisle and get nine gallon jugs of water and dump each one of them out because that's how, much it take, that's how much water it takes just to slaughter one chicken. That's not even including all the water that's used to produce that chicken for her to drink and for the grains to be fed to her. Just the slaughter process alone, it takes so much more water than even per pound cattle or pig slaughter plants. Also, I was just in the Orlando airport just the other day and I saw this. Talk about a sign of the times, Burger King advertising its veggie burger saying, a delicious combination of real veggies, brown rice, and rolled oats at Burger King. How many of you guys have had the Chipotle Sofrita? Anybody? The thing rocks. It's awesome. Go out and buy more of them. We want the company to keep them. On their website, they're saying vegans and carnivores unite. Try their, meat, their meaty tofu sofritas. It's awesome. These are all signs of changing times. Where once these ideas were wholly foreign, now they are firmly cemented into the mainstream. So much so that Time Magazine is talking about both the meatless and the less meat revolution. I can't stress this enough. The real gains that are being made on this issue are from people engaging in meat reduction. More and more people are deciding they want to eat less meat. They may not be becoming vegetarians or vegans, but they want to eat fewer animals and more plants. And that's the reason why half a billion animals have been spared per year in the last few years from factory farms and slaughter plants. We have come such a long way from the days when people didn't know about these issues, from the days when there were no laws that protected animals at all. We've come such a long way from the wilderness of that era. We've come a long way when a 13-year-old boy was thinking about becoming a vegan, even though he had no idea what the word meant. <laughs> Yet we still have a very painfully long way to go. As impressive as the strides that we've made in recent years are, we still know that we have a marathon to run. We have so much work to do when still our nation right now says that it's a crime in all 50 states to take two chickens and put them in a ring together and allow them to fight for a couple minutes, but it's perfectly legal to take eight chickens and put them in a cage where they can't even spread their wings for two years? That cannot stand. Practices like gestation crates and battery cages and veal crates, they didn't come about overnight, and they're not going to go away overnight either. But I do feel with every fiber of my being 
that we are going to reach a day when people will look back in utter revulsion at the ways in which we so commonly abused farm animals in our era. And they're going to be asking themselves, how could anyone have let that happen to billions upon billions of animals? It's not like we didn't know. We know. It's not a secret what's happening anymore. People know what's happening. We know about the violence and the cruelty that's being inflicted on these animals for no reason other than that people just want cheap meat. Yet, it's going to take a lot to get to that day. But for those of you who consider yourselves part of the animal protection movement, I hope that when we do reach that day that you'll feel very proud of your participation in this historic struggle. Because I believe that we're going to get to that day when we have a truly humane society, a society in which our relationship with other animals is one that's no longer based just on violence and domination, but rather is based upon compassion and respect. And you will be able to say when that day comes, you know what, I was there that I didn't sit idly by on the sidelines and let somebody else get in and try to do this, that I got in there and I started playing the game for animals, that you gave a voice to the voiceless, that you took the side of the vulnerable against the cruelty of the powerful, that you shine a bright spotlight on this dark and otherwise hidden world of factory farming. And I know how impossible that type of world may be to see that day come when these practices do get relegated to the dustbin of agricultural history. It may seem impossible to think about a world without factory farming. It may seem impossible to think about a world in which Americans are not the top carnivores on the face of the planet. But let us not forget that it was Nelson Mandela who said that it always seems impossible until it's done. It would have seemed impossible for a man who spent nearly three decades in prison to become the president of his nation. It would have seemed impossible to people just about 100 years ago to think about women not only voting but having a prominent place in American politics. If you look at the congressional debate back then when they were debating about suffrage, what you'll see is that people were in the Congress were actually on the floor saying that they would have to adjourn Congress once a month because women would be too hysteric to even rationally contemplate legislation. It would have been impossible to think in the 1940s that Americans would be using the same water fountains and going to the same hotels and using the same pools or that we would have a black president and yet all of those things happened. You know, there was a historian who one time told Gandhi, he said, you know, sir, I'll tell you something, I think that your dream of freeing India from British colonialism, it's impossible. And Gandhi's response was telling. He said, sir, your job is to teach history. Ours is to make it. And that's our job in the animal protection movement, to make history, to write a new chapter in our relationship with other animals, one that we can truly say is humane and that offers animals the type of respect and compassion that they deserve. Thank you. You can hit me anytime for any reason. There's my email. You can call, give me my card. You can call me. I'm very open. I would love to hear from you anytime. I think we're going to also have some Q&A, right? Well, I know we're running over, so, but. Okay. All right. And yes, we we'll have we're going to have a little trivia, too, in just a second. Sounds great. So uh, we are going to have some time for Q&A, just a couple questions. Um, Erica, do you want to come up? Uh, before we start Q&A, I have an opportunity for you. This opportunity involves being a part of what our work is here and being a part of making history. If you live in Massachusetts, raise your hand if you live in Massachusetts. Great. Every single one of you can participate. There is a bill, H1456, that is pending right now in the Massachusetts State House. It would prohibit gestation crates, veal crates, and battery cages here in Massachusetts. We have a real shot at passing this bill this session. We are going to be going out door knocking tomorrow. We're going to have a very short time for questions right now. But if you would like to ask Paul and Erica more questions and have an intimate brunch with them tomorrow. Meet us at O2 uh, Cafe in Cambridge, very close, and then join us afterwards to help spread the word about these practices and drum up a lot of support for this bill. So with that said, there's more information in the table in the back. I hope to see all of you, every single one of you, in the cafe tomorrow. And uh, now we'll take maybe two questions. Yes, ma'am. One of the problems in uh, confronting the people that know nothing about vegan, and you say, I, 
Uh, thanks for your question. I don't know if anybody heard it. I, I might not hear it up there. All right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when I became a, a vegan, I thought the same thing. I kind of thought it was like maybe like holding your breath, like you could do it for a little while before you die. Like that was like basically <laughs> what was going to happen. Um, until I started meeting other vegans who had been doing it for some time, and I started reading like from Carl Lewis, who said when he was winning all of his gold medals that his vegan diet is what helped him win them. Um, and so, you know, I look at, I think it's important um, for those, for people who are vegan to have a good, um, to have a good appearance about them so that they don't reinforce that myth that, um, that you're going to be protein deficient. However, um, I, I don't know, has anybody ever met anyone with a protein deficiency? Anyone? We do have one person. All right. Were they in the United States? They were, yeah, wow. Uh, I've never heard of one in, in, um, I mean, maybe if somebody has like some intestinal disorder or something, but, um, Protein deficiency is not something that really plagues Americans for the most part. Um, you know, for the most part, our number one killer in this country is heart disease, which the studies are overwhelmingly clear is uh, largely um, contributed to by, among other things, a diet that's very high in, in animal products. So anyway, um, you know, look, my, my suggestion for people is not necessarily, you know, hey, you, you know, think about that is it all or nothing where they're going to just keep on doing what they're doing or be a vegan i think that things like meatless mondays things like mark bitman's vegan before six these are the type of things that seem to be driving the progress that is helping uh, save animals right now and so to me the question isn't vegan or not vegan to me the question is standard american diet or moving in the right direction and just to add for anyone in the audience who does want more information, you referenced Dr. Greger. His website is nutritionfacts.org. It's a wealth of information on a whole host of health issues. And you can also visit tryveg.com, which is a website, Compassion Over Killing Runs, and we do talk about issues. People have, might have some questions about where they get their protein, but it also gives you recipe ideas, meal ideas, what to look for in grocery stores. Oh, oh, I have to hold it. This is new. Um, I have a question about the ag gag um, efforts, and um, I know that a lot of the criminal liability being brought is against the workers who are actually treating the animals poorly, and um, obviously we don't want them to be doing that, and also those are the people that are kind of the least powerful in the whole corporation. I'm wondering if um, in your conversations among the lawyers and um, your organization, if you talk about ways to um, maybe go after the slightly higher ups um, in those corporations and hold them accountable as opposed to these people who are probably just doing what they've been told they have to do to keep their jobs. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And, and, and some of the cruelty convictions that I discussed, some of those employees were managers or supervisors in some capacity. And there's always an effort for sure to highlight the fact that these abuses are occurring right under the nose of the people who own these facilities, manage these facilities, and operate these facilities, and ultimately they are in charge. Unfortunately, in many cases, it's those who are caught on camera who do get convicted. It does highlight the abuses that are so rampant in these facilities uh, so that the public can learn about them. And I think that having these convictions is so important to send a message to other facilities. But you are right that management is always the, the, the way that we try to expose how these abuses are allowed to happen. Yeah, I would also supplement that by saying that there's nothing that will strike fear in management more than slaughter plant shutdowns. I mean, you look at so many of these plants like Catelli Brothers <clears throat> or Bushway or Hallmark, HSUS Expose as a result in slaughter plant shutdowns. Oh, and um, Central Valley Meat, COK's investigation. They lost, you know, slaughter plant shutdowns are very damaging to these folks. And uh, we at HSUS just finished the uh, settlement with the owners of the Hallmark plant for a $155 million settlement, the largest settlement in any animal welfare case of any topic anywhere in the world ever. And that sends the biggest signal to everybody that animal abuse doesn't pay, that you will be have your slaughter plant shut down, you'll have loss of business if you allow egregious cruelty to animals to occur in your facility. We talk about um, the major problems in, in big factory farms, the major methods of confining animals and such. 
and we moved to ban gestation crates and battery cages, but I'm wondering what are the alternatives and are, like with the cage-free eggs, I mean, many people purchase cage-free eggs thinking that they're making a difference and they're doing something good, whereas it's just a replacement mm -hmm. measure that's not necessarily humane. Right. So yeah, there's a difference between saying that it's not any better and saying that it's not humane. Uh, the fact is that most cage-free facilities, I think most people would walk in and not think, oh, this is humane. But if anybody ever tells you that there's not really a difference between battery cages and cage-free, they likely haven't been inside of these facilities. It's hard to imagine something worse than a battery cage confinement operation. I've been inside many of them uh, dozens of times in my life, as well as commercial cage-free operations. And while I personally wouldn't want to live in either one of them, there's no doubt that cage-free operations, despite their deficiencies, are better. The animals have more space, usually more than twice as much space per bird. They can walk around, they can lay their eggs in nests, they can perch. And yes, you can point to all types of deficiencies. Nobody's going to doubt that. But the fact is that it's an improvement, and progress begets progress. And so my, uh, my feeling on this is that we shouldn't really punish people for not yet taking the last step. We should applaud them for taking the first step. The fact is, more than 9 out of 10 egg cartons right in this country right now are coming from birds who are locked inside of battery cages. People can talk all they want about these alternative animal products and they can have their hair on fire about how bad they are, but the fact is that they represent a nearly infinitesimal portion of animal products. I'd rather attack like the 99% of animal products that are coming from factory farms than worry so much about this minuscule amount coming from farms that are better than the factory farms. I agree. I think most of them aren't humane, but I think that they're better, and I, I'm really glad for the progress that's being made. I think we actually are running a little bit late, so I'm just going to give you about 10 minutes until 3 o'clock, which is when our keynote address is going to be. If you guys want to continue the conversation, though, you can come up and talk to, I hope that's all right, um, Paul and Erica during the break, but I just want to let everyone get uh, up. Oh, or wait, we'll wait, see wait, you I Saturday. Just, I have or one Saturday. book, one book by Coleman McCarthy, At Rest with the Animals, a fantastic Washington Post columnist for 25 years. This is an awesome compilation of his writings. For the person who can, rem who remembers, um, the person who remembers the latest, well, I would say, how, what is the latest slaughter statistic in terms of the number of land animals who are being slaughtered for food right now? Who was that? All right. Uh, what'd you say? Okay, yeah, got it. All right, yeah, yeah, you. All right, got it. You're going to win one book for knowing that grizzly statistic.